I was going to tell you that this will be our last class, and then they made fun of me over so you already said that <laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> so this time, I think it's probably true. Uh, <clears throat> let's start with the prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we all share in him. We thank you for the time that we have to get together and to study your word. Father, we pray you'd guide us in the way we operate and bless us with understanding. We again thank you for that word that we have. Father, we pray for this church that we would do things that would make a difference in this community. We pray that we could spread the word that Jesus is how you are saved. It is through Jesus that we can be saved. We, the world needs to know that, and we need to set it out there. Guide us in what we do and forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. My grandson just turned 16 not long ago. And, of course, what came up is what always comes up, you know, the car. And I, I used to put out a newsletter, and... I happened to be looking at one of them, and it, it says uh, this boy had just gotten his driver's license, <clears throat> or he just got his permit, and, and he asked his father if they could discuss the use of a car. And the father says, yeah, uh, I'll tell you what, bring your grades up from a C to a B average, study your Bible a little, and we'll talk about it, and get a haircut, and we'll talk about it. And the boy accepted the offer, and six weeks, six weeks later, they talk again, and the father says, I'm proud you brought your grades up, and I, I've seen you reading your Bible and studying your Bible, but I'm really disappointed that you didn't get a haircut. And the young man says, you know, Dad, in the Bible, Samson had long hair, and John the Baptist had long hair, and Moses did too, and Jesus had long hair. The father says, did you notice they walked everywhere they went? <laughs> <laughs> I thought about the young policeman out here on the, on the, on the front there that protects us. A police, a police recruit was asked on an exam, what would you do if you had to arrest your own mother? He said, I'd call for backup. <laughs> We've been reading a book in here, and I promised never to do that again. <laughs> Wasn't what I thought it'd work out, and, and uh, it's not the best way to do that, but we'll finish it up that way. We, we talked about the afterlife assumptions in the very beginning and, and what we've been trying to talk about. And the first one was that human mortality is not the result of sin, but is reflective of man's having been created of dust and made a little lower than the angels. These were assumptions that we made to see, and he does this in the book, and he does it better than I'm doing it, but assumptions to see, lay those out there and see if you can prove it by reading through the book. And that's kind of what we tried to do. The second one was that before the beginning of time, God envisioned it an eternal relationship with humankind in his own heavenly realm, never intending that man would live together on this earth. The third one was that by creative design, therefore, death is the birth canal leading from the womb of life on earth to an immortal life in heaven. That man, four, number four was that man's sin brought about spiritual death putting in jeopardy the eternal life which God desires with, with every person. Number five was that just as spiritual death entered the world through Adam, spiritual life has been made possible by the atoning death of Jesus Christ. Number six was that when physical death occurs, the earthly human body disintegrates forever, never to be reconstructed from the dust to which it returns. Probably up to that point, none of us have a, any question about that. Number seven, that upon death, man's innermost essence, known variously in scripture as soul or spirit, rests in the waiting room of Hades or Sheol until the simultaneous resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. 
Um, that's one that we've kind of dealt with quite a bit. Um, that number eight, that Hades or Sheo is a state of passive inactivity in which the soul is not conscious but is said to be sleeping. And that as with sleep, the moment one awakes at the resurrection will be as if no time has passed whatsoever since falling asleep. We, we work with that some. Number nine, that on the day of Christ's appearing, the dead will be raised, the present heaven and earth will be utterly destroyed, and Christ will set in judgment on all who have ever lived. Uh, we mentioned the fact that there is a judgment day. We, we read the chapters, uh, first, actually in 2 Peter 2 is the best, two or four. That's 2 Peter 2 and verse four and, and following that it's going to say there is a judgment day coming. Number 10, that the lost will be punished in hell, not with ongoing torment. Lost will be punished in hell, not with ongoing torment, but with everlasting destruction of the soul. <clears throat> and that this is the second death, that this second death is the death of the soul which was the subject of God's many warnings from garden to Jesus and from Pauline epistles to John's revelation. <clears throat> That's the one we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're not going to talk much because I'm going to read most of it and because I want you to have that, um, at least the thought. And then you deal with, with, with what you got. Twelve, that there is no biblical support for the idea of purgatory within either Hades or hell. 13, that the popular notion of rapture is a fiction arising from a relatively recent misunderstanding of apocalyptic test, text. Though I, I wrote test, but it's text. So those, those three are, are probably the ones that that we have, would have the most questions about. Anybody got any comments that they want to make about any of those? The first seven or eight of them we've talked about in detail. Whether it's convinced you of anything or not, that's, that's all right. Uh, we are reading a book. However, he follows, he follows his statements with biblical texts that are pretty good. It's pretty strong. Comments, anybody? questions about that we're, we're not going to go we're not going to get through all of what uh, is there uh, for this everlasting destruction of the soul but the gist of what he's saying is we have all or I have always been taught that the you will be in hell and you will be in agony and punishment forever and ever and ever amen and uh, Going back and looking at the scriptures, I don't think that's there. I don't think that's there. It's, it's there in a passage, but we've talked over and over and over, and you'll always hear me talking about this, context, context, context. You've got to study the Bible where it is, when it happens, and all that. You can't, you can't drag the first century up here and say, this never happened. Uh, so you, you have to deal with the context, and that's true of any scripture that, that you're working with. You've got to know what's going on at the time, what they see, what they think, and what it meant to them, not to us. Uh, it, it may mean the same thing to us, but their situation may be well different than ours in a lot of things. Questions? Now don't talk about me behind my back. Talk right here. <laughs> Anybody, I, I don't call on Lowell because I don't like to put him on the spot. <laughs> no, I don't mind at all putting him on the spot. That was wrong. Okay, we're going we're to be looking, if you got a book there, we're going to be looking in chapter 8. <clears throat> we're going to be talking about what happens in the afterlife. And it's going to be basically to those who are, I, he calls them wicked. I'll call them lost or whatever. And to some degree, we need to figure out what we believe in all of this 
but we need to spread Jesus into this world, and we got to know why we believe what we believe. Uh, if we're afraid to talk about anything, anything that, that's in the Bible, then it, it hinders us from, from being able to promote Jesus in this world, which needs it desperately. Um, I've heard, I heard some, <clears throat> some preacher a long time ago, I don't even know who it was, <clears throat> but I heard the thought that if, uh, if the world isn't destroyed soon, they're going to have to apologize to Jesus but because we're so bad. We're getting so bad, and that's a long time ago, <laughs> and I don't think we're going in the right direction now. <clears throat> Pardon me for my voice. It'll be good for reading. <clears throat> Okay, uh, here's, a, here's a quote from C.S. Lewis. Have any of you guys know who that is? He's an Englishman, wrote Mere Christianity, good book to read. He's a, what is he, Church of England? I don't even know what that means, but, but uh, he, he wrote a book, Mere Christianity, and he's, he's got a couple. There's uh, um, The Great Divorce is one that's it's interesting reading. It's not, I'm not promoting the thought so much as it'll make you think. And, and, and if you can, you know, if you can write a book and make people think you've done, you've done good with it. And Mere Christianity, The Great Divorce, The Great Divorce was the other one. Uh, it, it, it will make you think. There's another one too. Um, and I can't think of the name of it right now. But anyway, he's, he, th those books are worth reading. They're, they're like this book. They're, they're worth reading. You will learn some stuff from it. Anyway, C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain is the other book. That's the one I'm reading from now. Hell was not made for men. It is in no sense parallel to heaven. It is darkness outside, the outer realm where being fades away into non-entity, Hell was not made for man. It is in no sense parallel to heaven. It is darkness outside the outer rim, realm where being fades into non-entity. That's C.S. Lewis <clears throat> from a long time ago. He, he, he died in our lifetime, but he's, he's, he's a philosopher and he, he's a good writer. Ask a random, random sampling of people about hell and what you'll probably hear is that it's a place that you don't want to go when you die. Ask them to describe hell, and odds are that you'll hear talk about fire and brimstone and gnashing of teeth and, and of an eternity in the midst of hell's leaping flames. You'd ask them if they take the prospect of such a hell seriously, and your likeliest not will hear evasiveness, uncertainty, and even derision. We all know that's true. We all, we're, we're all thinking about that. If pressed, of course, most folks could live with the thought that there is some future fiery furnace for child molesters and serial killers and maniacs like Hitler and, in my humble opinion, Putin of the world. And there's, there's more, and I might be on the list. But to think that broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to the torture chamber of hell is cause for increasing embarrassment even among believers. Indeed, in church after church today, that's a column I don't care about, our current aversion to such vivid depictions of hell may have more to do with today's ever frowning, I mean never frowning, God of contemporary Christian culture or even political correct notion of non-judgmentalism and tolerance than with any other scholarly rejection of the traditional view of hell's agony. It is true that, that our culture ha has changed dramatically in, in our lives. We've witnessed it. We've witnessed some being to very, very strict to not so much anymore about a lot of things. Some of it we're wrong on, some of it we're right on, but all of it that we do needs to come from the scripture. You need definitely to know why you believe what you believe. Um, you need to be able to answer the questions that will be asked of you um, when you're talking to people about Jesus. 
because there's a lot of there's a lot of difference from the time that most of us grew up to what these young people are growing up in and i don't think it's better but i remember our parents thinking the same thing <laughs> we're, we're going but we may be going downhill uh, jesus is as important today as he ever was and whatever we can do for the culture that's behind us we need to be able to do and one of the most important things is to know why you believe what you believe and that it's the right thing for whatever reasons, hell's literal flame, <coughs> flames have gradually given away to a view to many of an everlasting mental or emotional suffering or to the eternal absence of God's love and some vaguely defined separation from God which lasts forever. And I've heard that. I've heard that out there. If for many folks the literal music of hell's licking flames has ended, the melody of ongoing, never-ending suffering of some kind manages to linger on. After all, even if there is absolutely no basis in fact for identifying the story with hell, how does one possibly erase from his mind the fiery furnace of the rich man and Lazarus, which we talked about last week? <clears throat> so we got that behind us a bit. As many would argue from, from uh, other more relevant references, there's just too much fire associated with hell to ignore the flames. <clears throat> so whether the imagery is taken literally or metaphorically, the idea of nonstop torment continues to dominate both the believing and non-believing world's conservation, uh, conversation about hell. So that's what we're talking about this morning. Is it that or is it not? And, and he's, we're going to go through a bunch of scriptures <clears throat> and... Uh, um, it's worth listening with an open mind, I guess. That's what I'm saying to you. Of course, <clears throat> there are two things about hell of which we can be altogether certain. <clears throat> First, that hell will, be hell will be whatever it turns out to be. Whether or not our understanding is of it is... Uh, whether our understanding of its reality is anywhere close to being correct. Hell will be whatever it turns out to be. And second, that whatever it turns out to be will be appropriate punishment inflicted by a righteous and holy God. I think we'd... <laughs> Say it. Thank you. I take back all the bad things I said about you, Mel. Sleep, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Until the judgment, and then we either go into the presence of God or we're obl obliterated. So, what's the problem to a sinner? If if the sinner goes to sleep at death, mm -hmm. they they sit in, in Hades until the judgment day, unaware of anything, and then that that soul is destroyed. There's nothing to fear. There's except, no punishment. except destruction. Hmm? Except destruction. Well, You're destruction, gone. You're no more. When, when they die, when when all of us die, that's essentially destruction until the until the judgment. The way you it is. It is. Now I'm reading a book, <laughs> and I'm I'm keeping Marvin out of it. But what he's saying, and from the scriptures, that has been the case. And we're going we're gonna to read some. Show me the scripture. <laughs> well, we're going to read them right now. Anybody else? That's, that's the, so what, what that, that actually says is it's a kinder, gentler thing than punishment forever and ever. Go ahead, Leah. I wish you had a microphone. Do you want to live or do you want to die? You want to live forever with God, or do you want your soul destroyed? 
Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I think get close enough to you. Apparently, a soul is not destroyed. When okay. God creates a soul, spirit, it is not destroyed at okay. any point after that. Okay. Now, whether we go live with God and we die, that's one way, or we go to eternal punishment the other way. Okay. So we're going to live regardless. I mean, we are not going to be destroyed. Okay. Let's, let's, uh, I think those are good. That's, that's our take on it. Now let's read what we says and pay careful attention <clears throat> to the scripture here as, as we read it. <clears throat> I apologize for this. My voice was perfectly good till Lord hollered at me a while ago. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna read some things with those things in mind, <clears throat> those two things right there in mind. <clears throat> now, this is some guy's opinion. This is not well, this is some guy's opinion back. <clears throat> okay, this is some guy's opinion that he's backing up with scripture. Okay. So, and, and that's what we do, isn't it? <clears throat> that's what we want to do with everything we do. We want to know why we believe what we believe. <clears throat> and if it comes out, it, it'll come out. If I can read. <clears throat> okay. Given those two principles or beliefs that I just read to you, debating the nature of hell could be seen by some as nothing more than an interesting academic exercise, which is in the end is entirely moot and therefore needs a needless waste of time, which we just kind of talked about. <clears throat> But can anything which God has spoken ever be a waste of time? In the light of many scriptures which address the subject of hell, <clears throat> surely God's intent is that we have some understanding about the fate of the wicked. The Hebrew writer assumes basic knowledge of the resurrection and eternal judgment to be elementary. In Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go, <laughs> that's different than what I memorized. Elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of the repentance from death, dead works, and of faith towards God, of the doctrines of baptism, or the laying on of hands, or resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. <clears throat> Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. It's always possible that the consensus view of hell's ongoing conscious torment is entirely accurate. Given the descriptive imagery in the text, all one has to do is point to the words. The biblical language is so familiar that we can almost close our eyes and see the fire and smell the smoke. But have we possibly missed something about those flames? Is there another way that we are meant to understand the purpose and the effect of hell's fire? And if so, might it be an important difference in how we respond to the reality of hell? One of the intriguing, intriguing questions in all of this discussion is what the disciples themselves might have understood about the nature of hell. On the one hand, despite a shortage of Old Testament references to hell, it doesn't appear that Jesus had, had to explain to his listeners what it was all about. Talking about the disciples, it doesn't appear that Jesus had to explain what he was talking about here. They must have had some, some idea of hell. If nothing more than the word associations which Jesus made with the prophet's ancient apocalyptic images of unquenchable fire, never dying worms, and gnashing of teeth. All of that easily would have been connected with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, we know what that means. Which for the Jews was past and future all at once, and there would have been no mystery about the parallel Jesus made between hell and the smoldering garbage dump just outside of Jerusalem everyone would have understood the picture directly. That burning place where they burned everything in Jerusalem to get rid of the germs and the worms and all that stuff. It was a fire pit. 
On the other hand, it would be decades before John revealed his revelation, book of Revelation, with a unique, uh, unique uh, vision of the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's in Revelations. <clears throat> and that hasn't been written in their time. It's written later. In the meantime, the popular image of hell so familiar today seems to have had little or no impact on the teaching or functioning of the church in those early years. They didn't think that. So how much weight can, you, can be put on the traditional view of hell? What follows is a case for understanding hell's punishment as ultimately culminating in the complete and total destruction of the wicked body and soul. That's what he's going to try to say here. That's what we're listening for. The primary scriptural cornerstone for the case is Matthew 10, 28, in which Jesus warned, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It remains then for us to evaluate the case presented here on its own merits and decide it for yourself whether it best reflects the scriptures, what the scriptures teach on the subject. And then here he says, come let us reason together. That's what we're doing. What kind of fire is it? Instantly, there are problems with taking the fire of hell literally. Like heaven, hell is a spiritual state in which souls are no longer in flesh and blood or earthly bodies. Those physical bodies will long since have been deteriorated, replaced at the resurrection with spiritual bodies fit for a perfect realm. So whatever fire there might be in hell would certainly have to be such as would punish spiritually embodied souls, not physically embodied souls. When you think about it, the combination of literal earthly bodies and literal flames of fire would hardly bode well today for the idea of continually burning. Just how long could a body of flesh last when lit by literal flames? At the very least, God would have to transform our physical, present physical bodies to accommodate a reality never before experienced, which would mean that we would no longer be talking about earthly, literal earthly bodies, much less literal earthly flames or fire. However, to move the discussion along, let's assume for the moment that the fire is absolutely finger scorching literal or at the very least, perfectly descriptive of whatever spiritual fire God intends. The question remains, what is the nature of all the biblical fire associated with hell? Is it a fire which torments, or is it a fire which consumes? That's important. Although not a single Old Testament passage overtly claims to describe hell for us, and we, we talked about that in Sheol. They, they understood one way, and we probably understand another way. The imagery of fire association with God's judgment against both nations and individuals is inescapable. Beyond all doubt, ex uh, for example, it was literal fire which consumed not only the burnt offering, but Aaron's sons who offered a strange fire before the Lord. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And then Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nabab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Their bodies were consumed right there in front of everybody. Was fire used as an agency of punishment? No doubt about it. Did it have a lasting effect? Unquestionably. But did the pain of the flames that but did the pain of the flames last forever? Not there. Not in that one brief moment. God's judgment had been executed on the wicked. Through fire, Nadab and Abihu were not tormented into fire. They were consumed by their bodies right there in front of them. 
They were consumed. The same is true of the 250 men who had joined with Korah in his rebellion. After the earth opened up and swallowed Korah and his family, I hope all, everybody knows that story, fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Again, that's number 1635. Again, the word is consumed, not tormented. And then there's Achan, who after being stoned for bringing sin into the camp at Ai, was burned along with his entire family. For God said, he who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to them, Joshua 7, 16. There are also, also those two different captains, along with their men, who, who were sent by the king of Samaria to Elijah. If I'm a man of God, said Elijah to the first one captain and then to the rest, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and or your men, 50 men. Then, hell, then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men, 2 Kings 1, 9 through 14. Fiery destruction was the fate of Israel's enemies and even Israel herself. As for Israel and Judah, God said, I will send fire upon their cities that will consume their fortresses. That's Hosea 8, 14. Virtually the same language is used regarding Israel's enemies, including the Philistines, and he lists a whole bunch of them here, the Philistines and gives you the scripture, uh, uh, scriptures. The Ammonites, the Damascans, the Moabites, and the cities of uh, the citizens of Ar of Moab, and those scriptures are there. Obviously, none of these fortresses were tormented by fire, but destroyed by fire. Throughout the scriptures, we see numerous variations on a single theme, the burning of waste, which changes only with a particular substance being consumed. That's what happens with fire. More often that substance is stubble, which quickly catches fire as, and just as quickly is gone. For example, Obadiah predicts that the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Esau will be stubble and they will not be, and, it, and they will be set on fire and consumed. What follows is even more significant. There will be no survivors of the house of Esau. Obadiah 18. When the stubble is placed in the fire, nothing is left. Applying the metaphor to human victims, there are no survivors. If perhaps there is suffering in the fire, more importantly, there is no one left to tell about it. The scripture is the same when Joel warns of the coming of the day of the Lord in Joel 2, 3 through 5, saying, Before them, fire devours. Behind them, a flame blazes like a crackling fire consuming stubble. And again comes the metaphor when Isaiah speaks, Babylon's destruction, specifically including the astrologers and stargazers, surely they are like stubble. The fire will burn them up, Isaiah 47. Same again with Nahum, uh, assure, when Nahum assures Judah of the fall of the Ninevites, saying they will be consumed, Nahum 1 and 10. If there were any doubt about what happens to the stubble which is burned, the, the doubt vanishes as Malachi describes the day of the Lord when the wicked will get their due. Among all the Old Testament references which have apparent allusions to the day of judgment, heaven and hell, perhaps none is more direct than the passage uh, says God. You will again see the distinct, distinction between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve God and those who do not. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and evildoer will be stubble and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. What is the result of fire and the furnace of God's judgment? Not a root or a branch will be left to them. This is Malachi 4, one through three. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of their feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. If this is meant as a picture of hell, the furnace can roar as long as one night, but it will be no time before somebody's carrying out ashes. 
So when at last we come to what Jesus said to his disciples about the danger of forsaking him, we know exactly what he's talking about. If anyone does not remain in me, warned Jesus, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up and thrown into a fire and burned. John 15, 6. Burned, the question becomes, are they burned in unending, unending agony or are they completely destroyed? Destruction, Jesus implies, could not be clear. <clears throat> not that of the Hebrew writer who warning against our own falling away speaks of a land that produces thorns and thistles, this is Hebrews 6 and 8, being worthless and in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned, which is to say destroyed. These images are but distinct echoes of what God has said centuries earlier regarding the lineage of Jeroboam in 1 Kings 14, 10. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is gone. To suggest as some has that the burning bush which Moses saw on Mount Horeb in Exodus 3, 1 through 4 proves that there can be a fire that does not consume is to highlight the rule pointing to an exception. When we see fire combined in context with a word like destroy or consume, we're no longer dealing with an exception, but rather with the natural meaning uh, which ought to apply to those words, even if they happen to be used symbolically. Still for some, some will ask, doesn't the fire of hell last forever? They may even point us to any number of passages which speak of an unquenchable fire for instance, there is that reference in Isaiah in, in the mighty man who will become tender and his work a spark. This is uh, Isaiah 131. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. Perhaps for, or perhaps to Isaiah's description of Edom's pending punishment in this is Isaiah 34, 9 through 10. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur, her land will become blazing pitch, it will not be quenched night and day, its smoke will last forever. <clears throat> day and night forever sounds a lot like burning, doesn't it? Yet, don't forget the ending of that passage. From generation to generation, it will lie desolate, no one will ever pass through it again. The fire itself may, be, never, may never be quenched, but its work has been done and completed with lasting effect. Nothing survives the blazing pitch. Far from unquenchable fire suggested the in, suggesting the endless suffering of whatever is put into it, the idea that nothing can hold back the fire of God's judgment, it will do its work. Circum this is uh, Jeremiah 4 and 4. Circumcise your hearts, you men of Judah and people of Jerusalem, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. Again, Jeremiah gives the, the uh, proper emphasis as the focus shifts away from the fire itself to the inflamed judgment of God which lies behind it. Jeremiah 7:20. My anger and my wrath will be poured out out on this place and it will burn and not be quenched. The unmistakable point of all of this unquenched fire is that God's righteous judgment will have its day. Nothing and no one can stop it. Indeed, Jeremiah provides us, uh, provides us with a direct link between unquenchable fire and the fire which consumes, says the prophet Jeremiah in, in chapter seven, verse 20. The Lord said to me, I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jer Jerusalem that will consume her fortress. Ezekiel 2, no, Ezekiel as well, gives the uh, connection saying, this is Ezekiel 2, 47 and 48. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm about to set fire to you and it will consume all your trees, both green and dry, the blazing flame will not be quenched and every face from south to north will be scorched by it 
everyone will see that I, the Lord, have kindled it, and it will not be quenched. Ezekiel 2, 47, 48. We see the same word associated yet again in the announcement of the Messiah's long-awaited appearance. John the baptizer says of Christ in Luke 3, 16 and 17. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing, winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What then does unquenchable fire do? It makes desolate. It consumes. It burns up whatever is put into it. If perhaps you still believe that the fire literally burns forever, even so, don't get, up, don't get hung up on how long the fire burns. Concentrate on what it does. It's a fire of total destruction. It's not just Old Testament prophecy that speaks of consuming fire. The Hebrew writer tells us that even under the New Covenant, in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Lest we miss the significance of this passage, it's important to know that the language here cannot possibly be confused with ancient prophecies against Israel's political and military enemies in which fire might be symbolic of their overthrow. The Hebrew writer is talking about God's judgment against individuals and where else but in hell. But if it's hell's fire, as hell's fire is the subject of the warning, what that fire does is consume, not torment. In the same, this is 2 Peter 3 that we're going to read. In the same way that the present heavens and, and earth are reserved by destruction, are reserved for destruction by fire, Peter tells us that the un, in 2 Peter, I just said that, didn't I? Peter tells us that ungodly men are also being kept for the day of judgment and destruction. 2 Peter 3 7. Like the cataclysmic fire, which will completely obliterate the universe on that day. Hell is also a fire that consumes, a fire that destroys, a fire that causes the wicked to perish. And what would you liken it to, Peter? Second Peter 2, 6 through 9. To the fire that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, comes Peter's reply. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, then he knows how to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. And Jude concurs, saying that Sodom and Gomorrah serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Jude 7. Eternal fire. You mean the fire that keeps on burning its victims forever? Not if Sodom and Gomorrah are anything to go by. The fate of those two abominable cities stands as the typical illustration of a consuming fire. In the wake of that catastrophic fire, however long it burned, nothing was left of the two cities, not even a trace. For anyone still insisting that hell is about going, ongoing torment in fire and brimstone, serious thought needs to be given to a specific day in history when fire and brimstone literally rained down on the wicked. To be sure, there would, there would have been suffering in the process. Undoubtedly, even some weeping and gnashing of teeth. But their suffering would not have lasted for long, only long enough for the rain of hot sulfur to do what it needed to do to alleviate God's righteous wrath and to rid the land of its evil. Jesus himself put it in Luke 17, 28 and 29. In the days of Lot, people were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Luke 17, 28 and 29. Eternal fire demonstrates the nature of hell's fire, not its duration. Uh, so when we hear Jesus speaking about eternal fire, there's no reasons to think in terms of clocks or calendars. Time is not the issue. Effect is the issue. 
Is eternal really forever? Maybe we're thrown off by the, by the words which are equivalent of eternal but different. Words like forever and everlasting and even those who don't necessarily mean without end. Merely consider the many uses of the Hebrew word alam and the Greek word aeonios, both of which mean the same as eternal. Through the use of those two words, any number of things are described as eternal, which did not last forever. For example, speaking of the sprinkling of the blood of the Passover, God said in Exodus 12, I said 124, but I think the message is 24. Obey these instructions as a lasting, that's the word eternal, ordinance for you and your descendants. Then there's the Aaronic, Aaronic priesthood. The priesthood is there by lasting, that's eternal. Uh, ordinance, Exodus 29, 9. And their uh, anointing shall surely be an everlasting, that's that same word, priesthood throughout the generations. Does an eternal Aaronic priesthood square with our even now being priest under the great high priest Jesus Christ? Consider also the servant whose ear had been drilled to the door symbolically in, indicating that he would be thy servant forever, same words. And there's Caleb's inheritance, and there's Samuel's apprenticeship, and there's Solomon's temple, and there's Gehazi's leprosy, which was to cling to you and our descendants forever. I left out of a whole bunch of stuff. Any of these situations and, un un and occurrences, slow down, Marvin, are any of these situations still ongoing, continuous, unending? Is Samuel still an apprentice? Solomon's temple still standing? Is Gehazi's descendants, if any of them remain, still afflicted with rev, uh, leprosy? In all these instances, equivalent words to eternal were not to mean there would never be any end to the effect described, only that their certainty was guaranteed as long as it's God himself. And there's a whole much more to that. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to give you any opinion. I'm telling you what's there in the scriptures and you got to make you you got to decide for yourself what you believe about that. Um, th there's a lot more there to look at. We're, we're quitting right at the road where it falls off the edge. But I'm just telling you, because you believe something doesn't make it true, unless you can get it from the scriptures. Um, if you if you look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And this is the chasm, and Lazarus is over on this side, and that's the other side, and you're in paradise, and they're in hell, and you can look over there and see them. How can you feel? I mean, how can you say, let them burn forever, they're wicked? Is that what we do? Does that even make sense? Now, I'm just, I'm just, laying this out there. I'm not telling you what to believe and never will. But if you were here and you were looking there, I would feel sorry for a puppy. I mean, of course puppies are better than most humans, but, but you see what I'm saying? You, you gotta be careful when, when your Lowell wants to speak. <laughs> Do I let Lowell speak at this late hour? <laughs> Go ahead, Lowell, I'm done. I, you know, as far as I can tell, Lazarus was not... Louder, louder. As far as I can tell, Lazarus was not cognizant of what was going on. He was asleep. So he's not looking over to see what's going on with the rich man. Um, and so I, I can't see where that would be valid for, you know, for someone that... Anyway, for that, that discussion. The other thing I want to point well, out... How did, quick, the, how did, the, how did the, the, the guys know that he was looking over? I mean... Where, where does it say that Lazarus is looking over? The rich man did. The rich, the, the rich man was looking over, wasn't he? Yeah, the rich man was, and that may be part of the punishment. You know, he was, he was there. Oh, you and, think he can see one, but you can't see the other way. Exactly. Okay, you're making that up. No. <laughs> Go ahead. The, the other thing is, in, in Matthew 25, I, I was listening, and I couldn't. But anyway, he doesn't deal with the idea in verse 46, Matthew 25, and these shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The same word is used for both there. 
can we say that we can have eternal life but not eternal punishment? In well, if, you're, if your punishment is destruction, it's forever. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's forever. But my if understanding if was, your punishment is heaven, it's forever. But in this case, you're done. Yeah. But you're done forever. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to influence you, and, and obviously Lowell's wrong on most things. <laughs> Good point. I love having you in class, man. That's why I give him a microphone. Go ahead. We're out of time. If it's destruction, then you don't exist. And then you don't exist. Why not just go ahead and do what you want to do and die? Because you're going to be destroyed. How many of you want to die? You exist anymore. So what's the point? Well, how many people do you want, do, do they want to die and be dead forever? Most of us want to be resurrected. The point is it's punishment that you don't live forever. Okay, I, well, I wish you could say that out loud. I'm, I mean, you just said it out loud on this. I'm turning it off.